Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. In this video, we're going to look at problems students face in Turkey. The aim of this video is to enlighten you so that if you are planning to come to Turkey, you know exactly what to expect and how to avoid these problems. If you're already studying in Turkey, you know how to you know, navigate properly so that you can avoid these problems. And if you are already facing any of these problems, you know how to find a way out. Okay, studying abroad is an amazing experience, but it also has its own challenges. It helps a lot when you know the kinds of challenges that students before you have faced so that you know how to avoid them or how to solve them if eventually you find yourself in a similar situation. To make this video, I asked some of my friends to share their experiences with me to let me know any challenges they have faced and how they solved them because here we are not just about ranting about the problems, we want to actually prefer solutions. Studying in Turkish is really challenging and laborious, especially if you are studying the social science, because you will be studying and taking the same exam with, the, with people whose mother tongue is Turkish, and it will be very, really, really difficult and hard, but it's not impossible. So, during the video, I will be playing some audio clips, or I will be sharing the writings that some of my friends sent to me, while taking you through the PDF I have created right here. Yes, you can get the link in the uh, description below. So basically, we are going to use this PDF as a guide from section to section i'll be explaining my own experience and i'll be explaining other students stories so that you understand how these problems even occur and um, how they actually solved them all right like i said the aim is to be aware and avoid these problems and um, if you fall into any of these problems learn how to solve them okay so let me quickly take you through the pdf we're going to discuss of course, choosing the right cities, choosing the right universities. We are going to talk about university and regist course registration issues. We are going to talk about adapting to the education system. How different is it? What are the challenges students face? We are also going to talk about academic life. You know, how many years will your program last? Um, what are the issues facing PhD and master students regarding supervisors and thesis? And um, is it possible to get a faculty position here? Uh, and then we're going to talk about this classic phrase that you would hear all the time. Uh, it means nothing can be done. And don't worry, I'll give you, <laughs> I'll give you examples to explain uh, when this is used. Okay, and um, we're going to look at language barriers. Of course, uh, we're going to look at uh, culture shock in food. We're going to look at cultural differences and how to adapt food lifestyle. Um, history and politics, entertainment. Uh, we're going to. I'm also going to share my experience. On, <laughs> I'm going to give you two funny stories of um, you know some cultural differences. Okay. Uh, then we're going to look at housing and accommodation. One of the biggest issues international students face here. If you are done with your tumor, if you are currently in tumor, or if you are planning to come as a private student. This is one thing you should mind, you know, you should make sure you, you get this right. Honestly, it's a, it's a huge trouble. Anyways, I'll try my best, inshallah, to um, explain the problems and how to avoid them. All right. Uh, we're going to look at the types of housing and accommodation you can go for. Then I'm going to share a website with you uh, to find the cost of living averagely in several cities. Now, Wahala literally means problem in Yoruba. That's my <laughs> mother tongue. So I'm going to tell you the steps to take to avoid, you know, apartment wahala. And uh, I'm going to share this list with you. Uh, a very important list published by the government of neighborhoods that uh, foreigners can no longer find an apartment in. All right, I will explain, don't worry. And um, we're going to look at residence permit issues. So as a student, your residence permit is based on you being registered to a university. Simple. You are an active student, you have paid your fees, you are in a university, you are studying there, you get your residence permit. So what are the issues regarding this? We're also going to talk about that. The problems with visas, the problems with health insurance, uh, opening bank accounts, all these things, we're also going to navigate them. Then we're going to look at employment opportunities, you know, available jobs for students. Can you make extra money while studying? 
It's a question a lot of students ask, so we're going to look at that too. All right, I have this video here to help you uh, find an internship. You may be interested. Uh, and then I'm going to list out some common jobs for students. Now, we're going to look at weather challenges. <laughs> this one too is very key. And um, the effect of weather challenges. And then um, finally, I want you to comment below either right now or after watching this video, if you have faced any challenges in Turkey as a student here, uh, please let us know what those challenges are and how you solved them. And if you are planning to come here and maybe I did not remember to speak about one of your concerns, you can also comment below. Old students will respond, new students will respond. I would also be responding. Please subscribe if you're enjoying this video. Like I said, please get the PDF file to this in the description below. All these links, you can easily access them by getting the PDF file. You can also visit my website. A blog post about this same topic is published there. And uh, you can also access this PDF from there and access other websites and other videos that can help you get information. That's the most important thing. And also teach you how to navigate some of these corners. All right. Now, to start, I want to start with education because um, since this video is for students, for those that are planning to come here or for those who are already here and planning to get into a university, choosing the right university is very, very important. Since this video is made for students, the first thing that would affect having a peaceful stay here is the university or the city you are in. To explain this, I want to give a story of a guy. He got into a university in a very, very far city through an agent. This city is about nine hours from Ankara, yeah? There were about 10 or 11 international students who got into that university at the same time. They were the first set of international students to get in. One person had to come with documents of the remaining 10 of them, 11 of them in total to you know, get them stamped at the embassy, get the equivalence documents for them because they could not get it in that city. It was a very small city and it was just one university in that city. It was a state university. He spent about um, 10 days in Ankara trying to figure these things out. So um, it's not as if these problems cannot be solved or it's not as if they are not doable. But if you want to save yourself this stress, you are advised to choose universities in Ankara, Istanbul, Izmir, Maybe Konya, Kayseri, I would add, and um, other cities that are quite well known. I'll leave a list of cities in the description and the updated version of this PDF will include maybe at most seven or ten cities that at least there are a good number of international students there and you wouldn't have to move up and down because of document issues. Now that we have cleared everything about choosing universities in the right cities um, it's also important to check your programs. There are some programs that are not accredited. Actually, they are not much at all. You would rarely find them. And if you are not choosing universities in cities outside the ones listed in the description, I don't think you would have problems with accredit accreditation or, you know, your bachelor's certificate or master's or PhD certificate being applicable in other countries. So that is not usually a problem. It is usually a problem when you are in a university that probably it was recently built or a new department was recently added. So if that is the case, it should take some time for them to um, set up the department and then get accreditation for it. So that is the issue regarding this. And the simple way to avoid it is to choose universities in cities that international students are already familiar with. As for programs in Turkish, if you are studying here privately, that is you are sponsoring yourself, I do not suggest that you study in Turkish. If you're not studying something that is related to literature or language or translation, it is not the best option to study in Turkish. Of course, programs are cheaper in Turkish. If it is just because of the cost that you're choosing to study in Turkish, uh, I personally do not recommend it. For scholarship students who come here, of course, if you're a YTB student, the Turkey Baslari Scholarship, or if you're coming here through DNET for high school or for university, you would be taking the Turkish language course for one year. So that way you automatically learn the Turkish language. But is that enough to actually study in Turkish? Um, not exactly. So basically you learn the grammar, you learn how to make sentences and how to understand when people speak to you. 
but academic Turkish is quite different from that and it is more challenging. So if your program is in Turkish, you need to study harder, like you need to do beyond what you get from the Turkish language courses to, you know, improve your Turkish language. You need to be able to easily digest info in Turkish and speak fluently because these are the things you need, especially masters and PhD applicants who will be doing their thesis in Turkish. If you know you don't really love the Turkish language, <laughs> you're not a big fan of Turkish culture, you know, you don't, you know, you don't find joy exploring several cities here in Turkey, those are signs that you may not want to do your language, your program in Turkish. And finally, the difference in curriculum is a very, very big issue. So let me explain first with my case. Um, I'm studying computer engineering here, and the computer engineering curriculum in my university is a mixture of software engineering, electrical engineering, and computer engineering. In my first semester, we finished Python, we learned Python. Second semester, we learned Java. And um, in third semester, we did C++. And by the end of the second year, we had completed data structures and algorithms. Uh, for someone like me who didn't have much technical background, I mean, regarding computation, you know, coding and all these things, that was quite challenging, really, really challenging. And that was because I did not take time to look at the curriculum and see if it's something I would be able to handle. If you want to know more about the challenges I faced in that, you can watch this video right here. Now, um, another example I would, I would give regarding curriculum is um, a friend who told me that um, his course is political science and public administration. However, the curriculum just focuses on public administration and not just public administration, the Turkish public administration. So it's basically learning uh, stuff related to Turkey, which may not be very, very useful after graduation if he leaves Turkey. So that is one thing to also check. Any course at all, I think you must always check the curriculum and be sure that, okay, yes, this is what I plan to do. This is what I want to do. This is similar to where my interests lie. Now, if you want to find cheapest universities to study in English, I have this video here. You'd find it very useful. Just click on this and it will open in a new tab. And if you want to find the 10 universities in Turkey, the top 10 universities in Turkey and the tuition fees, I have this video for you as well. Now, let us talk about university and course registration issues. So first, let us talk about Denklik. Denklik is an equivalence document. So you are coming from your country and you have followed a particular curriculum. Yeah, you have your diploma. They want to see if that diploma is uh, on the same level with the Turkish um, diploma for that same grade. So let's say you are applying for undergraduate, you have finished your high school. The courses you took, how similar are they to the courses a Turkish student has taken throughout their high school? So because they admit them on that basis to Turkish universities, if yours is also similar, if the coursework is similar, you also get admitted to the Turkish university. Hmm. So that is the basis of Denklik. And now the rules are changing, you know, so basically to get your equivalence document, you need to have stamped and authenticated your documents from your home country, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it could be from the Ministry of Education as well. Now, in the case of Nigeria, for example, because I went to the embassy recently, it is clearly stated at the embassy that if your documents are not stamped, back at home by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Education, they would not stamp it here. So to get your equivalence <laughs> document, you need to get it stamped back at home before bringing them, of course, the original ones. And then after getting here, you need to get it stamped at the embassy before you can apply for your then click. So this is very, very key. And students, unfortunately, just because this information is not easily reached, a lot of students do not do this and they have to send the document back home, get it stamped, bring it here again, stamp it at the embassy before getting the then click. Now, the second one I'll talk about is the loops in the system. So <laughs> we went to a university with a friend the other day. He needed to complete his registration. Um, the then click was asking for, I think, his student's number. So we were saying that we have not registered to the school. We need to get our then click to register. So we went back to the school and the school is saying, I cannot give you a student number because you are not registered yet. So you need to go back to the Denklik office and get your Denklik first 
and then I'll register you. So <laughs> sometimes there is that miscommunication, there is that loop and you're just left in the middle. I think what happened eventually was that we paid the tuition, we paid the school fees first and then the uh, person at the registration office of the university registered the student as a passive student, not an active student. And then um, with that, we could get what we needed from the school to apply for then click. <sighs> Quite tricky, yeah. So sometimes the people working there do not just know. Sometimes they don't know. Sometimes it's just that rules change. Sometimes you just have to experience it to know what's the latest info in town. All right, now, number three is um, separate registration for university and Tomer. In some universities, if what is Tomer? Tomer means um, the Turkish language course. So for those on scholarship, you'd first be in Tomer for one year, learning the Turkish language before starting your program. If you're a private student, if your program is in English, you'd be starting your program directly. So this may not concern you. Now, for scholarship students, um, maybe you have registered for Tomer and you have not registered to your department. So depending on your university, there may be two separate processes. You need to confirm this by going to the international student's office. So a friend in, I think, 2020, I had a problem regarding this. So sometime in July, he was told that his residence permit has been terminated and he got this information about three months after the residence permit had been terminated. And the information from the Ministry of Immigration about cancelling his residence permit went to the other dormitory. So there were three months in between before he got that information about the cancellation of his residence permit. Why was it cancelled? Because the university uh, cancelled his registration. So basically you are getting a residence permit on the basis that you are a student, an active student. So once the university cancels your registration, they have no basis to give you a residence permit. So that was the issue. And why did the university cancel his registration? Because um, the student had not completed the registration to the department. So um, what happened was that a senior had told him that after Tumer, you can continue your university registration, that is registration to your department. But that wasn't the case. Um, he actually needed to complete everything at once. And there was a time frame to submit his then click, which he had not submitted. And um, because of that, they thought probably the student is no longer active. And then they terminated his registration. So problems like this happen. He had to go back to, the, to his country. But before leaving, he had to first of all solve the problem here. As he was a scholarship student, the problem was solved by the scholarship body. So he had to leave, go back to his own country, apply for visa again, and then come back here. And then he had to pay a fine for uh, staying in the country without a residence permit for a particular period of time. So this, these, are, these are some issues that I really would like to uh, invite them so that they can share their stories. And from there, you learn a lot. Now, number four issue, some unis do not accept online payments. If you find yourself in this situation, perhaps you went to your home country, you could not come back before the deadline for registration. Um, you can ask a student in Turkey to pay for you. Find a way to transfer the money to them. They go to the bank and they pay in your name. So do not stress if you have this issue. And finally, uh, course registration. So um, for those who are just finishing somewhere, I think this one is for you. If you are just going to start and you're going to register for courses, it is important that when you are registering for courses, you are very fast, you have a very fast internet connection. So I'll give you an example of mine. I'm registering for programming 101, which was Python in my case then. There are students from year two, year three, or maybe year four who are still registering for this course because they have not been able to pass it. There's a particular number of students the lecturer can take for that semester. And because, of course, maybe 150 got into the department. So 150 people are supposed to take that course. Those guys from Abu will probably choose the course before you and you may be left out there unable to select that course and you'll not be able to complete your registration. So um, get a good internet connection, plan beforehand. You know, once it is nine o'clock, it usually starts at nine in my university. You just start registering. And if you cannot register, 
the next thing is to go to the international student office or go to your departmental office and ask them to add it for you manually they would do that for you so no worries all right so that's it about university and course registration issues now we want to talk about uh, the education system and i want to highlight um, basic things here so first of all um, class in classroom if you do not understand you are expected to ask i think this is the same everywhere uh, and you may want to raise your hand as well before you speak now one thing about the education system here as well is that um, so in my department for some courses we have two midterms uh, one somewhere in the fifth week another one in the eighth or ninth week or tenth week and that way if you have two midterms it's usually graded as 30 percent midterm one 30 percent midterm two 40 percent exam so this was new to me so it is possible to have two midterm exams and i think that's good because if you can ace these two midterm exams you have a greater chance of acing the exam and finishing with a good grade all right now it is possible that you have just one midterm and then the percentage is 40 percent and the exam is 60 percent or the percentage is 50 percent and the exam is 50 percent so it's good to ace midterms once you can get 80 90 percent in your midterms you have a high chance of finishing with a b or an a all right so of course please avoid cheating it's heavily discouraged here you don't want to get yourself into trouble and then finally um attendance counts in some departments you know some lecturers may decide not to but general generally the university requires you to attend the classes for at least 70 percent of the time if not you automatically fail the course all right now finally um i want to mention that when they give you assignments or projects some departments in universities uh, some lecturers may decide to give you one day two day three day extension so if you submit one day after the deadline you get minus 10 points if you submit two days after the deadline you get minus 20 points if you submit three days after the deadline minus 30 points i suggest you always try to submit before the deadline and maybe if you know on those rare occasions where some things may come up then maybe these deadlines may help so this is one thing i like this system and i think it's really helpful all right now to finish up with academics um one thing it is important to know is that your bsc is four years you can finish in three and a half years by taking courses from above so to, for those asking whether it is possible to you know finish faster than others of course it is very very possible if you work hard masters two years and phd four years so for master students you have to take some take some courses pass them and then start your thesis so basically you have just one year for your thesis and usually a lot of master students do not finish within that time frame they usually take one semester extra or one year extra so maybe three years on average phd students your program is four years you spend you you would spend the first one year or two years depending on how fast you are taking classes of course just like masters then you are going to take an exam called the yetel lix enough which literally translates to proficiency exam it's like taking an exam first before you start your thesis so this yetel lix enough is usually difficult especially if it is in turkish so if you're going to if your program is going to be in turkish and you want to do your phd here you have to make sure you are have come to terms with these challenges and you are ready to navigate them all right now um supervisors and thesis you may not be on good terms with your supervisor the issues may come up and um, that can affect how long you will spend in your program or that can affect how long your program would last and how long you'll be staying in turkey so you may want to you know what i advise is that you research professors back at home before coming you can go to the website and look for the faculty navigate to the faculty and see the teachers there especially in these um, top universities you are going to easily find them and look for those that are doing something similar to your research areas that way you'll be sure that okay the probability of um, having you know uh, friction with your supervisor is reduced and you'll be able to finish your program on time a not so good relationship with your supervisor can affect opportunities presented to you that is you know attending conferences and presenting papers or 
maybe working with them to publish journals. These are very, very yeah, key issues you may want to look at before coming. Now, finally, uh, faculty positions. I spoke to a friend the other day who uh, was letting me know that the university wasn't saying anything regarding giving him a research assistant position or a teaching assistant position or a graduate assistant position. So um, this is one issue. I do not think universities have that policy here where as a graduate student, you automatically get a position. So I think it's more common in the US and European universities where um, they, they not only consider you for the research you want to do, but they consider you uh, as a as an employee, basically, either as a TARA or GA. So um, if you want to come here, especially for those planning to come under the scholarship, fine, the stipend may be good enough, but if you have families, if you have children or people back at home depending on you, and you are hoping to get a faculty position here, I think that is something you may want to discuss with the university or a professor before coming. If it is not certain, I don't think um, it is the best idea to just come here and expect that things will magically happen. Of course, language is a big issue regarding this too. Maybe the program is in Turkish. Maybe you are going to do your research in English and you are just new to the country. You don't know the Turkish language. How would they give you a position to, cheat, to teach? These are also issues you may want to consider. All right, that wraps it up for academics and education. If you enjoyed this, please subs subscribe, like, and share. Then we're going to move to the next video or the next ones.